Addiction to legal and illegal drugs have been called the number one cause of preventable disease, illness, and death in the United States. To provide us an update on advances in the treatment of addiction, it's a pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Timothy Fong. Dr. Fong is an associate professor of psychiatry at UCLA. He's the director of the UCLA Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship and he's also the co-director of the UCLA Gambling Studies Program. Dr. Fong. Uh, hello out there. Welcome, welcome, and uh, thanks for sticking out for uh, day one. It's always apropos uh, to be talking about addictions in Vegas, uh, particularly at the end of day one as you embark on the rest of your weekend here. So um, that is my career as an addiction psychiatrist to focus on drugs, alcohol, gambling, and sex. Uh, I often get, like, uh, get uh, questions from people like, who do you like in the fight? Um, things like that sort of thing. But I'm not going to be giving any uh, gambling tips away today because you have to preserve all those uh, sort of things for yourself. But what I do have here today is uh, a tour of what's new in addiction medicine, addiction psychiatry. Undoubtedly, these are the patients that you see all the time, that trouble you, that puzzle you, that leave you with bewilderment, anger, frustration, rage, sympathy, passion, and wondering what can I do as a primary care physician in two or three minutes, or in five minutes, or seven minutes, or in between my appointments to help mitigate and reduce the scourge of this very, very serious disease of addiction. So first what I have here, just very quickly, a, a, a tour around the country of what's happening in our field of addiction. This moves very quickly weekly, monthly, things change all the time. I just want to highlight some basic things that we're seeing, particularly in California. Uh, number one, of course, we see the medical marijuana industry and business in California really expanding and becoming its own, not just a cottage industry, but a, an industry with a lot of economic force. Uh, we see softening of views nationally. We see products like edibles, uh, where we have THC contents as high as 15, 20, even 30 percent. This isn't just a local California phenomenon, it's a national phenomenon. Of course, we've seen a lot about the prescription opiate epidemic through the last 10 years, and we get this ad nauseum in papers and conferences, but as primary care providers, how do we see it? How do we experience it? As an example, just this past year, uh, in January, uh, we moved Vicodin and Norcos from Schedule 3 to Schedule 2s, right? Sounds like a good idea, right, to make it more difficult to get medications. But now what are we getting? We're getting those calls at Friday, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock. I need my refills. I'm going on vacation. I need to come in. Doc, and if you leave me short, I'm going to be in pain or I'm going to be in withdrawal. These are the questions and things that you as primary care providers are facing all the time. The emergence of naloxone kits. How many of you here, when you prescribe opiates, also prescribe naloxone alongside to be given with the patient? Anyone? So this idea will become standard of care at some point to be prescribing an antidote for overdose to patients who are getting a, quote, lethal amount of opiates to take home with them. Not quite sure where we're going to go with that in primary care, but it's coming. And again, is it standard of care to discharge a patient on naltrexone, an opiate antagonist, an opiate blocker, or, no, or given naloxone from coming out of a detox setting or coming out of the medical hospital? Go into the medical hospital to be treated for pneumonia. You have an opioid use disorder. You leave that hospital. Your opioid receptors have reset. You go back to using the same amount of opiates you were using before the hospital. That's what sets you up for overdose and death. E-cigarettes. This is fascinating. I was reading on the plane this morning about e-cigarettes, that in our young people, ages under 18, the use of e-cigarettes has tripled, tripled in three years going from 1% to 4% to 12% of our nation's youth under the age of 18 are using e-cigarettes. Brand new information, because what does that mean? What exactly is an e-cigarette? What's in them? What's the harm? What do we do as primary care providers when we're faced with those questions? We'll have some more data on that later. Again, I put some local trends uh, for anyone from California. Uh, heroin in the 818 refers to our uh, own Los Angeles Valley community with the area code of the 818. Uh, and I put that up there as it's an example of a sleepy, 
uh, middle class, upper middle class suburban community where you can have high amounts of access to heroin and street level heroin of high potencies. It just shows you that in your own local communities, trends for addiction and access to drugs and alcohol uh, and other things change all the time. I know we have a little bit of a national audience, so one message for you is to go back and really put your ear to the grindstone and say, what are people using? What kind of drugs are out there in my own neighborhood? What can I get? What can my patients get access to? All right, let me move to that. Real quick, uh, DSM-5 came out in 2013, about a year and a half ago. Uh, many primary care providers have a copy of the DSM. Maybe you haven't looked at it recently. But it's really important, I think, to know what some of these trends are. Because when it comes to addictions, things have really changed. You go back to medical school and residency, you were taught that substance use disorder was either substance abuse or substance dependence, right? You remember that? Two different kinds of addictions. And you never quite made sure, well, what's the difference between the two? I know dependence has tolerance and withdrawal and abuse doesn't. Are they related? Yes. Are they kind of like a precancerous lesion? Yes, but they're really kind of separate. Left foot, right foot. This has changed now with DSM-5. They've now created a single disorder called substance use disorder, where all the criteria for substance abuse and substance dependence have been merged together to get a single 11 symptom criteria disorder. Here are all 11 criteria. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Now, for those of you still are close to training, remember we have mnemonics to remember certain things. We're still waiting for one of our medical students or residents to create the mnemonic for substance use disorder off these 11 criteria that we can remember. Like the cranial nerves, we remember that. Ooh, 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 to touch and feel very green vegetables. Ah, does that ring a bell? No? Well, we want to have something that for substance use disorder. So until we have that, this is how I'm encouraging primary care folks to remember it. Four domains. The first domain is loss of control. The inability to stop using drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, video games, shopping, internet. Having problems with preoccupation, inability to spend, stop spending more time on it. Craving that substance, craving that behavior to the point where it could not think of anything else. Where it affects and impacts your daily life. So if you think about craving, how is that loss of control? Well, it's a loss of control over ability to say no. It's a loss of control over attention. So it's a loss of control over the ability to reshift and focus on what you need to do that day. Attend the conference, attend your class, pay attention, pick up the groceries. So you lose control over basic human elements of urges and cravings. That's domain number one, a repetitive loss of control. That's addiction. Second domain is you continue to use this drug or alcohol despite external problems, despite social impairments, fights with your girlfriend, breaking up with your boyfriend, loss of job, not doing your uh, uh, schoolwork, giving up fun activities like uh, recreational activities or dating. You keep using despite those harmful consequences. Then there's the third domain, internal risky use, internal consequences. You develop liver cirrhosis because of alcohol and you continue to drink. That's an internal damage. Or you have depression because of cocaine use and you continue to use cocaine despite knowing that that makes your depression worse. So internal damage as well. And the fourth being again just basically pharmacologic criteria, tolerance and withdrawal. I want to highlight with tolerance is not just drinking more and more to get the same effect, but it's drinking or using the same amount of drugs and getting a diminished return. So a lot of our patients will say, yeah, I've been using cocaine for quite a while. And you know what? It's not as good as it used to be. The stuff they're selling on the street isn't as good. I'll say to folks, no, 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 the same stuff. What's changing is your brain. You're developing tolerance. That's a sign of addiction. Same thing with withdrawal, also important highlight. So loss of control, external damage, internal damage despite uh, consequences and pharmacologic changes. That makes up the four main core symptoms of addiction. We now know that all these symptoms do have a neurobiological seat. They have biological, psychological, and social risk factors to why they get expressed. And very simply, we know that addiction is a brain disease no different than other chronic illnesses like diabetes, hypertension, or asthma. What's also new in the DSM-5, and this is interesting for primary care providers, that number one, cannabis withdrawal is an actual psychiatric disorder now. So stopping your marijuana use and developing these vague specific symptoms like irritability, insomnia, craving, that's a disease that needs to be treated. Caffeine withdrawal is an actual diagnosable disease that has its own CPT code. 
Now, probably 70, 80 percent of us in this room probably already meet criteria for caffeine withdrawal. But the real question is, at what level does it rise to public health impact? How does it affect primary care providers? Insomnia, insomnia, anxiety, shakiness, tremors. You don't think caffeine right away, you think of other illnesses or other medication. Think about caffeine. Think about that as a potential uh, source of that uh, condition. Tobacco use disorder is now uh, was, was formerly nicotine use disorder, rebranded as tobacco. Gambling addiction is now inside this chapter of addiction and is now qualified as an actual addiction. And then lastly, sex addiction did not make it into the DSM as an actual, quote, disorder that we can diagnose, but yet we see lots of patients come presenting with that chief complaint. All right, so when I'm thinking what did I want primary care providers to take away from this very brief talk, first, there's a lot of slides here. I'm not going to get through all of them. They're very easy to read. They're very good for reference material. I certainly know that your job um, to treat addiction is very challenging. But I want you guys to start thinking about your own practice and say, well, what can I do that's different? How can I improve? How can I up my game a little bit so I can do a better job of screening, assessment, treatment, and referral. And it starts with this acronym, ESPERT. Has anybody heard of this term, ESPERT? A few. ESPERT is not this little mascot that you think it is. It comes from the federal government. And the federal government said, we need a systematic approach that primary care providers can use to identify risky use of drug and alcohol, to give them tools to give a brief three to five minute intervention in the office to their patients, and then when they identify somebody who is at very severe risk for addiction, to give them the tools to refer them to specialty care and addictions. So it's a little bit of an acronym, it's a little bit of a philosophy, it's a little bit of a treatment approach. It's the idea that you, with every patient, should be screening for a substance use, give brief interventions to those men and women that screen at a high level and risky use, and then can refer them off to treatment, ESPERT. The value of ESPERT is that it makes the people with addiction become more visible. When they come to see me, they've identified themselves as having substance abuse problems. When they come to see you guys, they don't. I can't sleep, I'm depressed, my belly hurts, I blood in my stool, I can't lose weight, I'm having seizures, muscle aches, all the side of medical consequences of drug and alcohol addiction they're experiencing, they bring to you as their chief complaint. And it falls to you to be that detective, to make that link and say, you know what, the reason why you have insomnia is that you're waking up in the middle of the night in alcohol withdrawal. Or the reason why you're losing a lot of weight is you're using a tremendous amount of cocaine that's suppressing your uh, ability to eat naturally. All right, so some quick facts about what ESPERT can and can't do. Uh, let me back. Uh, let me back up a little bit, is that for the most part, if we're act, asking systematically that we're going to be able to pick up substance use disorder in the vast majority of men and women who don't even know that they have this problem. I'll give you an example of how I think it might work. Um, about six months ago, I went to a primary care uh, provider at UCLA for some sinus problems I was having. A new patient, they didn't know me from anybody. I made an initial appointment. They did not give me any information to fill out. I sat in the waiting room for 30 minutes, twiddling my thumbs. I get pulled back into the nurse's office, get my blood pressure, weight, all that. Sat another 12 and a half minutes before the doctor came in. The doctor visit was literally two and a half minutes, and that was done. And I said to myself, well, why didn't they use that 40 minutes in front of the two and a half minute visit to collect some systematic information about my health practices, what I drink, what I smoke, what I eat, what I weigh, what I do for stress. And again, our healthcare system has not yet adopted a way where we can collect that information systematically and use every minute to our advantage. That's what ESPERT is supposed to do for you, allow you to collect information about a person's drinking and drug habits without having to go through a rigmarole of a structured interview. So here's an example of a uh, Espert app that's available through Google Play that you can download onto your own iPhone or onto, and you encourage your patients to download. And it gives you rating sc uh, scales, questionnaires, and screening instruments. When I get to the screening, this is what I prefer primary care providers to do. It doesn't get any quicker than this. Not do you drink or are you an alcoholic. I've seen so many primary care providers do this. You're not an alcoholic, are you? You don't drink more than three a day, do you? You're kind of like that Jedi mind trick. Oh, absolutely not. 
How many times in the past 12 months have you had more than five drinks in a single day? How many times in the past 12 months have you had more than four in a single day for a female patient? Non-judgmental, not really critical. Patients don't know what you're listening for. If they say once, even a single time, yeah, that spring break in Vegas, I really tied one on. I had about six or seven shots. That's a single episode of heavy drinking. That's the screening positive that tells you I need to do a little more thorough assessment, a little bit of a deeper interview, maybe a three to seven minute interview about their alcohol use to see if there are any signs of DSM-5 criteria for uh, alcohol use. When we back up, what's a, a standard drink? Anyone work in the VA here? A few. A standard drink in the VA has a handle on it. Have you heard that one? Or comes in a, bait, in a case? No. A standard drink has 14 grams of alcohol. It's a 12-ounce beer. It's a 5-ounce glass of wine. Or it's a 1.5-ounce of hard liquor. A typical bottle of wine is about five standard drinks. When you hear some patients say, I'll drink a fifth of vodka. It's about 17 standard drinks in there. So knowing these weights and quantities are helpful and knowing right away, well, if they drank more than five in a uh, whole bottle of wine in a single night, that means they're already in an episode of heavy drinking. I'm going to screen for more. When it comes for drugs, I like to actually break it up into two screening questions. Number one is how many times in the past year have you used an, an illegal drug like cocaine, methamphetamine, bath salts? Versus how many times in the last 12 months have you used a prescription medication for non-medical purposes, such as you liked the way it made you feel, you borrowed it from somebody, or you were curious? Again, that's a very different way of stating it and screening and saying, how many times in the past 12 months have you gone into your mom's medicine cabinet and taken her Vicodin? So if you use these leading questions, you're going to get leading answers. But if you take it a little bit more open-ended, people are going to actually be more surprisingly and tell you the truth. And it's up to you to make those linkages between the symptoms they're coming in with and with their behavioral patterns. A fourth question I'll sometimes qualify is, how many, or do you have an active medical marijuana card? Because many times people in California don't consider marijuana to be an illegal drug. And certainly that would not hold true in Colorado. All right, so then that's the screening part. You're encouraged to do the screening, and then once they come up with a positive to do an assessment, which could be a brief questionnaire you hand to the patient, maybe that application on an iPad, or going through some of the DSM criteria questions, either you're doing it, your nurse doing it, or anyone else in your uh, front office staff. Next, I want to turn to what we're hoping the primary care providers can do. Three to five minutes is all it takes to motivate someone, to inspire them to get onto a pathway of change to reduce their drugs and alcohol. I want you to erase your mind's eye of all the training you went to when you were in medical school and residency and who you saw drug and alcohol. You saw the very tip of that curve, the severest and most ill patients that would come into the middle of the night and go through detox over and over. That is not the 85, 90% of men and women struggling with drug and alcohol addiction in this world. That's the tip of the iceberg. When you learn motivational interviewing through free resources like this, you can do this in two or three minutes, really encouraging people to change their behaviors, to challenge them to reduce. So it might go something like this. You know what, sir? Um, I noticed on our screening that you've had several episodes of heavy drinking. I'm looking at our audit score, alcohol use disorder identification test that you filled out, and it shows here that you're at a moderate level of, of, of alcohol use disorder. Well, I'm encouraging you, let's try for a six-month moratorium on alcohol. If you continue to drink, chances are it's going to affect your heart, your lung, your kidneys. What else can I do for you today to get you to think about being sober for the next six months? That last question I asked is so pivotal, it's empowering and encouraging the patient to do it. But you know what it is? It's salesmanship. It's used car salesmen. What can I sell you today to make sure you walk off this parking lot with pinstriping, and floor mats. So patients aren't coming into your primary care office wanting to be sober. They're coming in wanting to have their blood pressure reduced, or their pain removed, or their sleep improved. And now they're going to leave that office suddenly with this prescription or this encouragement to stop drinking. You can say, that's, that's a tough sell. So it's up to us as healthcare providers to be much more about this is a positive change for you. This will improve your health. This doesn't mean you're an alcoholic. This doesn't mean you're a moral degenerate. This doesn't mean I'm going to kick you out of my practice because you're abusing drugs. 
No, I'm selling wellness, I'm selling recovery, and I'm recommending a three to five month period of recovery um, before you think about drinking again. The third part of uh, expert the RT referrals to treatment really refers to this. This idea, again, for those men and women that you pick up that have severe uh, and active drug and alcohol problems that they need to be treated by a specialist. So just like when I pick up primary care health issues, uh, for instance, low testosterone or thyroid or diabetes or some cancer screening issues, I don't do that as a psychiatrist. I refer them to the folks who do it all the time. What's different, again, is although this is a high subspecialty um, field of addiction, the number of providers that we have is so much more smaller, and the number of uh, demand is so much higher. So as an example, U.S. population, let me back up here, U.S. population 300 uh, million, roughly a little bit over than that, about a quarter of all the U.S. population are using drugs or alcohol at risky levels, not quite full diagnostic criteria, but kind of like that bad habit area. And then we know that only about 7% of the population is actually uh, needing full treatment for substance use disorder, specialized, high-level uh, quality of care. Of that 7%, 21 million people, 2 million people, one out of 10 people who need treatment for uh, addictive disorders actually receive it. Now, there's lots of reasons why, right? Denial, lack of resources, not wanting to go, uh, unawareness, all those sorts of things. But if I said to you, only one out of 10 patients with HIV or with cancer or diabetes actually got the treatment, you would say, we would have a national outpouring, an outrage on this. And we don't really have that for addictions uh, just quite yet. All right, so one of the things that people always ask me, well, that's great, but how do I find an effective treatment program? Because it seems to me that there are a lot of snake oil salesmen out there. There's a lot of uh, addiction things. And it's fascinating. These things are always on sports radios, talk shows about um, the magic cure for addiction. You know, come in and get the treatments and you'll walk out a new person. Well, it's because why are these so popular? Because this is a disease that affects so much about a person's individual life and their family lives that they will do anything. They're desperate to get better. I encourage you, though, here as practitioners to think about these strategies. Um, first, I'll skip this, is basically to remember that addiction treatment happens in basically five different settings, specialized treatment. Number one, and the most popular and most available, is office-based treatment inside the four walls of the office with an addiction treatment specialist providing psychotherapy, maybe prescribing the right kind of medications, uh, working with the family. That's the vast majority of it. For more severe men and women, we have intensive outpatient programs or partial hospital programs, three to five hours per day where they get groups, individual urine drug testing, intensive treatment experiences. There's a difference then at the next higher level between detox facilities, which are meant primarily to address the pharmacologic issues of withdrawal. They don't really go to the major roots of addiction. Short stays, seven days, 14 days, primary drugs only don't manage the psychiatric problems associated with them, like depression or anxiety. And of course, we have the, the most intense and most expensive is the residential treatment setting, of course, called the rehabs. In California, we are the world's nation, or the world's leader in rehabs. We have rehabs, of course, that are as cheap as five to hundred or thousand dollars a month, up to eighty thousand dollars a month. And again, it just shows you kind of the desperation that, and, and hope that people will put into this to try and get people better. So those are the official treatment settings that addiction treatment will happen. But I want to put a couple, clarify a few things that happen in there that a lot of primary care providers might not know. In the West Coast and California and other states, there are a lot of what we call sober living homes. These are not rehabs. These are unlicensed places of residences where men and women live and maybe there's some urine testing, but they do not provide treatment. The way I think about these, these can be safe places for a foundation of recovery where people can access 12-step meetings and then use that to access other treatment programs. But too, many, too often, a lot of primary care providers get that mixed up. And they think that a sober living house is rehab. It's not. A rehab is a licensed facility that has mental health and substance abuse treatment provided on site. A sober living house is simply a place to stay that drugs and alcohol aren't available. All right, so um, I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, so I'm gonna go through our medications and treatment slides uh, and just touch on the major elements I think that uh, primary care providers need to know. The first thing is when you say, when you identify someone with a drug or alcohol addiction, really emphasizing in your mind's eye as well as to the patient, 
The recovery from addiction really requires three things. You need to be taking the right medication, psycho, uh, biological treatment. You need to be engaged with the right kind of psychotherapy, psycho, psychological treatment. And you need to have the right kind of lifestyle changes, the people, places, things, to change in your life, in other words, the social treatments. So you go back to medical school, we learned that all mental illnesses were biopsychosocial conditions requiring biopsychosocial treatment. You only do one out of these three things, it's not going to go well. You do two out of these three things, it may go so-so. But you do all three, that's the best chance for recovery. And I put this up equally because I don't consider one more important than the other. It's pivotal to, to do all three. And that's how I like to address the language with my patients and say, we have to do all three, a three-pronged approach to get your recovery really strong and moving forward. All right, so quick word on medications out there for drug and alcohol addiction. We do not have any magic pills that cure addiction. We have, man, uh, we have a number of medications that can control this disease in a very significant way. Reduce the amount of drinking, reduce uh, uh, the likelihood of relapse, manage and target urges and cravings for that drug, lay the groundwork to do recovery, allow patients to sleep better, to concentrate better. Imagine if you're going throughout your entire day and spending 70 to 80% of your day thinking about drugs, where to get it, how to get it, and how to cover up your tracks so that you can't even listen and pay attention to who you're talking to, who's talking to you. When you have medications that relieve that, automatic thoughts, and now you can focus and attend to the moment, that's a really powerful experience. All right, so real quick through the medications, the FDA-approved stuff that we have. Alcohol, of course, we have in our toolbox. Um, first, before I go there, this is a downloadable, free, no-cost treatment guide available from uh, NIAAA. It gives you, meant for the primary care physician, screening tools, questionnaires, motivational interviewing tactics, referrals, treatment handouts, um, all that available completely free. So if you don't have a copy of this in your office, I would encourage you to go download one, have it available virtually, and print out copies for your whole staff and for yourself there as well. But when it comes to alcohol for FDA-approved stuff, this is what we got. We have Anabuse. Oh, I shouldn't use uh, brand name. I'll use generic. We have Disulfiram. We have Naltrexone Oral. We have Naltrexone Injectable. And we have Acamprosate. Four medications to target this very severe uh, chronic condition. How many antihypertensives do we have? How many antidepressants do we have? Dozens, you know. This shows you that finding medications for addictions is a long process and it takes quite a bit of time. The way I think about this very simply is that I think of disulfiram as a starter to recovery. It is not meant to be used in my mind long term beyond six months or a year. Why? It's a tough medication to take. You can develop some hepatitis. You get this for it. You do get fatigued on it. You can just forget to take it. I use it in the highly motivated individuals who are like, Doc, I really got to stay sober. I have a lot to lose. And those folks who are involved, where the family's involved, where the family member can witness and watch them take it. The family member can uh, encourage them to take it. That's how I think about an an abuse. Now, Trexone is an opiate antagonist that blocks uh, opiate receptors from functioning, and it basically takes away the urges and the cravings for alcohol, diminishes the priming effects when people are exposed to alcohol cues. But what it doesn't do, it doesn't make you 100% sober. So a treatment response to uh, an altrexone might be going from 12 beers a day down to six. You know, instead of every three weeks drinking, now you're drinking every six weeks. So it's important to realize that because many patients say, Doc, I'm not sober. Well, I'll say no, but your disease is much better because you're not exposing yourself nearly as much. The big problem, of course, with oral naltrexone as well, of course, is motivation. If you don't want to take it, you don't take it. Compliance. And that's why this kid came on the block. Um, I am naltrexone. If these are your slides that just emphasizes the thing that naltrexone does, and you can encourage this and say it straight to your patient, this is going to decrease the chance of you relapsing. This is going to decrease the number of heavy drinking days that you have. This is going to decrease your situations where you're drinking in a hazardous fashion, such as drinking and driving or drinking at a level and operating heavy machinery. Really clinically relevant and important things for folks. But this is really where I am naltrexone came along. How many of you guys uh, have used or injected I am naltrexone in the last 12 months? Show of hands. Uh, one, maybe, <laughs> maybe half, like a half injection. Um, again, this is your territory. This is not my territory. 
I'm a psychiatrist. I don't do injections, gluteal injections, more or less. That's what this is. This is a four-week injection in gluteal IM, decreasing drinking day, decreases heavy drinking day. We need more primary care doctors to be doing these injections. As psychiatrists, I can recommend it, and I uh, outsource it to my primary care docs, but this is something you guys can do and do it very simply, very easily. It works, works very well. All right, so, okay. When it gets to Camprol, now this is one where unfortunately I see it, although FDA approved, it's kind of a second line medication. Um, it's been around for about 10 years now, and it seems to work on uh, some patients who get that negative reinforcement for alcohol, where they drink not to get drunk or to experience the pleasure of drinking, but to take away that negative feeling they have that's not withdrawal, that's kind of a quasi-anxiety, quasi-tension, uh, the negative reinforcement. That seems to be the one that it works the best for. Um, there's some other new kids on the block that may or may not get FDA approval, the pyramid being the most promising one, and a whole host of others. But let's take a step away from alcohol and turn to the stimulants. And of course, if you're not familiar with the stimulant world, this is, I think, the most accurate cinematic depiction of methamphetamine uh, use and abuse that's uh, been around for a while. Um, and to realize that we've tried lots of things for cocaine, lots of things for methamphetamine, and to this day, we have no FDA-approved medications for that. So, unfortunately, what does that mean? That anything that we do prescribe is off-label, is research-based only, which tells us, again, that the majority of recovery from our stimulant dependence is going to be in the hands of psychosocial treatments. So there's a few researchy things that I try, but I think it's a little bit beyond the scope of most primary care docs to say, you know what, I'm going to try this off-label medication for methamphetamine dependence. Um, medical marijuana and marijuana, of course, we've had a number of very interesting molecules and compounds being studied for marijuana addiction, including a cannabinoid antagonist that was originally touted for weight loss, uh, combinations like a near substitute strategy with Marinol and Lofexidine, which is an alpha-2 agonist like clonidine. Um, but again, nothing works. Nothing systematically that I can say to you with confidence today in primary care doctors, use this medication first line for someone with cannabis use disorder. That's different though when it comes to smoking. Smoking, we have a wide, vast array of tools available to us. Uh, first, of course, is a major tool. How many of you guys are here from California? Should be a big bunch. 1-800-NO-BUTCH should be plastered all over your, uh, your walls or over uh, your mindset as well. Um, this is our state helpline for smoking tobacco cessation that operates uh, seven days a week. Uh, referrals to groups, resource materials sent out to patients, telephone counseling, uh, free nicotine gums and patches. It doesn't get any better than that in terms of no cost and low amount of work for you as a clinician to do. Identify someone who's a smoker and say, I want you to call 1-800-NO-BUTS. You're going to get a good response for that. But here's what we have in our toolbox for nicotine and smoking. Remember, natural quit rates of tobacco, if I say to you right now, one year from now, what that natural quit rate is going to be, it's about 7%. So seven out of 100 smokers will be tobacco-free one year from now. Just doing it on their own, through willpower, through various other things that they want to do. If they do 1-800-NO-BUTS or do a little bit of counseling, that number goes up to 14 out of 100. So suddenly now we're batting 140, still not major league territory. If we use any of these uh, pharmacologic medications that assist in tobacco cessation, we can get those numbers as high as 21 out of 100, or in the case of Shantix and Varenicline, nearly 40 out of 100. So again, we can do much better, I think, than what we historically think. But tobacco cessation tends to be what? Dirty, hard work, grind it out, not, quote, sexy work. Even amongst us as addiction psychiatrists, it's one of these areas of work that's really hard for us to do because it takes time. Why? Because the average number of quit attempts is nine before somebody actually is able to stop smoking. That means we got to go through this sales pitch nine times? You know, that's not really interesting or fun to me. But that's the disease. The disease must receive nine bolus doses of smoking cessation treatments before it starts to work. So use that, recognize it, remember, and don't give up on your patients and when they just say they won't. Real quick word about Shantix and Varenicline, because people always want to know about it. Um, 
been out now about nine years, uh, about 40% efficacy rate for total smoking cessation. It does have this black box for suicidal ideation, angioedema, potentially other rashes, and cardiovascular uh, events. My take on it is very simply, uh, we do not have causality to establish the link between varenicline and suicidal ideation. But because it's a medication that binds to the deepest regions of our brains, the nucleus accumbens that controls emotions, regulates emotions, it makes sense to me that there's probably a small segment of the population that will have some sort of untoward effect. But you know what? Same thing true for all antidepressants that we prescribe. Same thing is true for the antipsychotics that we prescribe all the time for sleep or anxiety. I think as primary care physicians that this is something that should still be in our arsenal to be used. It's the most uh, effective and most efficacious, I believe, for smoking cessation as it stands right now. Okay, so um, turning to opiates, prescription pills and heroin is a reminder. That means we as the uh, providers are half the drug dealers out there. And oftentimes when patients are on prescription opiates and they no longer are able to obtain their prescription opiates, that's when they transition over to heroin. So it really highlights that as providers, when we're prescribing opiates, to prescribe and say one minute, two minutes to our patients, what is your prescription safety pl uh, keeping plan? Where are you going to store it? Who's around the house? What are you going to do about it? And here are my prescription prescribing practices of the office. No need for a contract, just letting people know what you're going to do and be very firm about the amounts that you're prescribing. In our toolbox, FDA approved, we of course have um, buprenorphine. Uh, which requires an opiate, uh, uh, requires a waiver from DEA to prescribe it for the purposes of opioid use disorders. Does anyone in this room have a buprenorphine waiver to prescribe it for opiates? We have a few. And again, we have uh, uh, nearly 3,000 physicians in America that can do this, that they can use and prescribe buprenorphine from an office-based setting to treat opioid addiction. I'll say it very loud and clear, if you prescribe methadone from your office, for the purposes of opioid addiction, you are breaking the law. You are breaking the law. If you prescribe methadone for the purposes of pain control or depression or anxiety or anything off-label like that, you're not breaking the law. You're documenting it, and that's actually okay. The feds won't be concerned about you. But do not prescribe methadone for the purposes of opiate withdrawal from the office-based setting. That requires to be in a methadone clinic only. That takes us to our second FDA-approved medication, of course, which is methadone, uh, long-standing opiate treatment program, now well over 55 years of experience. Still what I consider the gold standard for pregnant opiate-dependent uh, individuals. For anyone recertifying, that's always the question that's on the boards, um, and that's the answer for the methadone. And we, of course, we have our two variations of naltrexone oral and injectable, also available for opioid use disorders. Okay, real quick then again about uh, buprenorphine, office base. You have to take an eight-hour course online or in person, and then you apply to the DEA, and then you get a special waiver to prescribe buprenorphine in the office. Again, if you prescribe buprenorphine in the office for the purpose of opioid addiction and you don't have this waiver, you're breaking the law and, the, and you're putting yourself up in a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, it's a partial agonist, so that's why we're able to use it in the office, meaning as a partial opiate agonist, you're going to get ceiling effects to limit the potential of overdose. So even if you swallow the whole bottle or take the whole box of uh, buprenorphine, there will only be a maximum amount of opioid-like effects that you will receive. So that's why we can attenuate withdrawal, because it mimics opiates. That's why we can take away urges and cravings, because it mimics opiates. But that's why we don't have to worry about overdose, because the maximum amount, you don't get full saturation and activity of the opioid receptors, not, uh, therefore not leading to death. Okay. So if you want more information about buprenorphine, uh, there's a lot of uh, information on the internet about how to get those trainings. Some of the professional organizations that do do the training include American Psychiatric Association, um, American Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, and any physician in America can get this waiver. You don't have to be a psychiatrist to do that. That's an example, because this is a sublingual medication. Oftentimes docs uh, never quite visualize what it looks like. That's an example of a patient uh, taking the buprenorphine. All right, so real quick about the nicotine um, stuff in addition to the uh, Shantix, I want to highlight something that I forgot to mention about the replacement. Uh, the biggest error I see in patients is, is uh, we do not combine gums plus patches. We tend to just stick a patch on somebody, 
But you know what? That patch is still going to take a day or 36 hours to get up to a steady state. Use a patch and then use gum on top of it. Active plus passive replacement. Or you can use lozenge, you can use an inhaler. It doesn't matter. And then you get better efficacy rates for nicotine withdrawal from there. Um, let me fast forward because I want to make sure I get some time for questions. Um, unfortunately, we don't have anything, again, for the other uh, illicit drugs of abuse, or do we have anything for the behavioral addictions. Um, we, of course, have a tremendous amount of evidence-based treatments for psychosocial. Um, that requires a whole talk. And the message there, again, to the, client, the patients is to never diminish either and say, oh, you only need to take the meds, or all you need to do is go to 12-step. You need absolutely all three to really do well. Um, here's what works in your office. Go back, think how can, how can I do more screening for drugs and alcohol? Can I use a, a, a standardized assessment? Can I take advantage of the waiting room time to collect more, collect more information? Why is this also relevant? Because you can now bill for expert practices through Medicare or private insurances and get back an additional 25 or 30 bucks per visit. That might get some primary care uh, folks' attention. Just Google expert CPT codes and you'll get a lot more information that way. Use FDA approved medications for addictions. Uh, realize that we do have more medications out there, but oftentimes it will require a uh, specialist to provide that. And I think what every office, primary care office should have in addition to that is if your state has a prescription drug monitoring practice to make sure that you are equipped to do that in California, it's called a Controlled Utilization Reporting Enforcement System, or CURES. It allows us to tickle this statewide database to determine whether or not a patient is receiving uh, Schedule II or Schedule III from other sources. Incredibly useful for primary care docs. Think about attending one addiction conference per year. Um, there's a million of these out there uh, in your local states. Nationally, American Society of Addiction Medicine or American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry are wonderful conferences geared toward clinicians and I believe primary care providers will learn so much from that. Have a breathalyzer and a urine drug screen capable in your office. Many times patients are, uh, therapy, or uh, primary care folks do not. It's just another uh, clinical tool to have. All right, so with that, I listed some websites where you can get more information. Uh, more referrals if you're looking for folks to, um, or to send people. And then lastly, most importantly, feel free to email me. You know, uh, I'm in academics. I got all day, most of the day. <laughs> I love that line. Just hanging out. Not really, but, you know, it's the, to me, it's the most fun part of my job. It's learning what's happening on the front lines, hearing from folks saying, hey, you know, I'm struggling with this patient. What are your thoughts? giving folks some supervision and some guidance. There are a lot of more uh, support out there for primary care docs than there ever used to be to do this uh, uh, sorts of treatment. So that's my email. That's my uh, direct office. Of course, you have these slides. So feel free to share these slides if you're doing some teaching on your own. And with that, we're ending right on the button, as they say. And we'll take a few questions uh, before uh, we end and wrap day one. Questions for Dr. Fong. I tell you, Alcoholics Anonymous is still the largest referral network ever set up for alcohol support. Uh, do you support it? Absolutely. So, I mean, 12 step is a phenomenally important uh, issue. The way I say that this to patients with 12 step, they're a little reticent. I say, the scientific t uh, evidence shows that if you participate in 12-step and you get a sponsor and you do a commitment to the meetings, not just showing up to the meetings, but a commitment at the meeting, setting up the chairs, passing out the books, making the coffee, that's what's going to increase your uh, chance of sobriety. Per sponsorship and participation. On the back end of it, too often primary care providers tell patients, just go to AA and that's all you need. Absolutely not. AA is not treatment. It's not treatment because it doesn't have a treatment facilitator. It's fellowship, it's support, it's community, it's, it's mentorship. It's phenomenally important, but as a single treatment modality, absolutely not. So. What, what's the cost of the long-acting naltrexone? The cost? Um, cash rate, uh, it's anywhere between 800 bucks to 1,000 per shot. Most insurance companies, though, are, are uh, reimbursing and paying folk, uh, folks, you know, either with a prior authorization or it's just part of their formulary. 
So um, we're seeing it more and more affordable. So in our domain, uh, we also see a lot of county programs. For instance, LA County has, a, a, they purchase a whole bunch of these naltrexone injectables. They put it on county formularies. So then many of our men and women with county, with Medi-Cal can access uh, the injectables uh, for free. So it's not prohibitively expensive. Oftentimes patients will say to me, that, Doc, that's so expensive. I'll say, you know what's more expensive? Uh, death, funeral, uh, and, and I don't say it like that, but I say, you know, ongoing condition. You're not gonna blink at paying this for cancer treatment. You can't blink at paying for this for addiction treatment. What percentage of the patients who are substance abusing uh, are self-medicating some underlying psychiatric disorder like bipolar disease, and how does screening for that figure into your management? So it's a great question. Um, the whole idea behind the self-medication hypothesis that men and women with addictions are using, quote, that drug of choice to treat whatever underlying problem they had, depression, anxiety, ADHD, personality disorder. Uh, we know that in, when men and women present to substance abuse treatment, uh, there's about a 70% chance that they have another psychiatric disorder present. Vice versa, when men and women present to primary care, elevated rates of all of those things. So, Dual diagnosis or having multiple psychiatric disorders is the rule, not the exception. The way I think about it is, again, we're talking about brain regions that are overlapping between drug and alcohol diseases and mood and anxiety. So drug and alcohol disease symptoms, uh, denial, or urges, cravings, loss of control versus depression, anxiety, lack of inattention, impulsivity, they all have various uh, regions that are about the same. I think, again, for primary care providers, it's so critical for you to highlight that and say, you know what, I'm not a mental health specialist, but my gut feeling about you is this. My instinct is saying this. My clinical experience is saying that you probably have an underlying mood or anxiety issue that's beyond my ability to treat in three minutes or less, and you really need to get the right treatment for it. That's it. Highlighting to somebody that they have more going on than just drinking or using drugs is so critical, and we really need to just trust our instincts. So often I, I tell our med students, you know, you can diagnose someone and get a feel for someone pretty quickly in mental health if you're just paying attention to how you feel, what you notice, and you're able to put all the, the clues together on, on first glance. Can you comment on internet addiction? Um, internet addiction is a fascinating thing, you know, because uh, we say, well, what is we addicted to? Are we addicted to the vehicle of internet, which is information and accessing information, or is the internet just the vessel, the carriage to get you to the thing you're addicted to? Drugs, alcohol, gambling, sex, video games, shopping. What we now know is that in DSM-5, there's a portion there, internet use disorder, where they have exploratory criteria really looking at people who are overusing the internet in any way, shape, or form that's causing them their lives. My, my, my sense on this is that it tends to be more about it's the addiction to whatever target you're used to, gambling and sex, and the internet just happens to be the way that you access it. We've had a few patients who come into our clinic who are true internet addicted, where they're in an, uh, addicted to internet access information, like news aggregators and blogging and, and commenting and things like that. Um, but those are far less common than the people who come in who are addicted to online gambling or online shopping or, or online or using the internet online to, to purchase drugs. Um, in, in our area, maybe that's that 818 you know, area code that you mentioned, I see a lot of um, high school and a lot of college kids now that are using um, marijuana and they have their mar medical marijuana cards and they're getting arrested. And yet when I have referred them to certain psychiatrists, you know, really prominent groups in our area, they're told that you don't have a serious problem as compared to other more serious drug users, I guess. So in your experience, what is the most successful program that's out there for all these high school and college kids that can't stop smoking pot just because they love getting high? There was most, most uh, high school and college kids on campus who can So um, let me start with first when we think about kids uh, under 18 and then people 18 and 24. 18 and 24, we're calling them, right, uh, young people, transitional age youth, or my favorite, emerging adults. <laughs> Brains are growing. We now know the following scientific facts is that if you start smoking marijuana before the age of 18 on a regular basis, you will lose 10 IQ points by the time you reach 30. Fact. If you start smoking marijuana after the age of 18, 
you don't lose those 10 IQ points. It just makes sense. You know, your brain's still growing before age of 18. All sorts of things are happening. You expose it regularly to potent THC agents. It's going to affect how the brain develops and grows. Unfortunately, what we know, because of limitations in federal funding and uh, just a lot of thought behind it, we don't know what are the most effective treatment programs for young people that are different from, from adults. Again, without a medication for marijuana addiction, we're really hamstrung to manage the urges and cravings for that. And then when you have a counter argument that a lot of people are saying, we have massive legalization and acceptability, combined with high potencies of THC products, it creates a real conflict out there in American society and thought. Well, on one hand, this is a safe, organic, legal, quasi-legal, soft drug. On the other hand, we have a very potent psychoactive uh, drug that has been shown to increase the risk of psychosis and, in, and damage people's brains. So it's a real sense of conflict. We don't have a, a large anti-marijuana lobby group like we, what we used to. And so I'm not surprised that you see conflicting views in your own communities. Some psychiatrists are for it. Some psychiatrists hate it. Some docs are for it, some are against it. In California alone, we have lots of, the only way you can access medical marijuana, you have to have a physician's recommendation to do so. Not a prescription, a recommendation. When I try and talk to some of these docs who recommend it, they don't want to talk to us. I'm fascinated by the kind of docs that really believe in medical marijuana. Because I think there is some real truth that there are probably some who will benefit greatly from medical marijuana, but we just don't know who they are. So the bottom line is, for, to your question, I don't have a great answer for that. But I would emphasize with young people who are addicted, the emphasis isn't about stopping them to use drugs. Instead, it's emphasizing them to build up life skills like resiliency, communication, stress managed, coping skills. That's what we're finding to be much more effective. Don't go to the route of don't do drugs because it's bad for your brain because we know kids don't respond to that. But they will respond to, you know what, why don't you learn about um, uh, how to play tennis again or let's get you back into some weight loss. Let's get you into singing. Let's get you into uh, playing uh, mu musical instruments. So that seems a strategy seems to work a little bit better uh, to promote wellness and recovery rather than to uh, criticize them and scare them because the scare tactics don't work. We'll take one more and then, uh, then we'll break because it's five o'clock. Right. Quitting time. Two things. Thank you for encouraging us to do the naltrexone um, injections in the clinic. I'm glad to have some encouragement to do that. And two, um, with the CURES report, I know that only a couple of providers in my group um, have already registered, but my supervising doc uh, forwarded us the, a new mandate that we have to have registered by January 1st to be, if we're prescribing scheduled drugs. So what was that? I was a little mumble. I didn't hear the last part. Yeah. Repeat that? Can, yeah, can you repeat oh, that? Basically, with the CURES report, we're supposed to be um, registered with that by January 1st if we're prescribing scheduled drugs. Oh, oh, oh by January 1st. It's a mandate. I yeah, guess, so. yeah, mandate. So, you know, uh, are you from California? Yeah, so the CURES system has a very kind of torturous system, very classic in California. It started off like gangbusters, but they didn't fund it. Pharmacies didn't report anything, so it wasn't very good. Finally, over the last year and a half, they finally actually put more money into it, so it actually works pretty well. Um, there was that bill back in November that would mandate physicians to check it, and if they didn't, they would get their hands slapped. That bill did not pass. So as a physician, if you don't check the cures, you won't get slapped at or, uh, or brought up on, on anything from the medical board or anybody else. But it's a valuable tool, and it doesn't take much time at all. So as an example, like we, we do this all the time in our addiction clinic. A new patient comes in, the first thing we do is we pop on, we look at their UCLA record, we go onto the state database, we, we look at their CURES report, and that's information. That's information that's really valuable. Um, I think where docs are vulnerable is if they pull up a CURES report, if it's very thick, if they don't do anything in response to that, that's where I think doctors are going to be in uh, uh, difficulty. So an example, you know, if you find out that somebody's getting multiple benzos and opiates from all these other providers you had no idea about, but then you don't address it in the medical chart or you don't say it to the patient, then to me that's actually, you know, a failure of care. 
you have to say to the patient, you know what, we ran your CARES report and we found out there were a number of other providers out there that were prescribing medications in your name. Let's talk about how that could have happened. It's very different than saying, you know what, I ran this report on you and I found you out. You've been cheating on me. You've been seeing other docs. I don't like this and I, this has to stop. So, so much of our approach with patients with addiction is so much in our delivery and so much in our approach. And we can get so much more information if we approach this non judgmentally as, you know, as an open, as a condition, and we're partners to figure out to solve problems rather than uh, blame each other. All right, thanks a lot, and have a great day two tomorrow, and uh, I'll hopefully see you next year.